pre-flight's complete 0520 to make a 0600 takeoff. And also expect to see rescue 160, which is a RAF C130J, is uh, assisting with the search. It is credible enough to divert the research to this area on the basis it provides a promising lead to what might be wreckage from the debris field. Almost two weeks into the search for flight MH370 and a dramatic development. At 10 o'clock this morning, the Prime Minister received a call from the Prime Minister of Australia informing him that two possible objects related to the search for MH370 has been identified in the southern Indian Ocean. This is potentially the most significant breakthrough in finding the missing airliner and knowing for certain what has happened to the 239 people on board. Could this satellite image help to solve one of the greatest aviation mysteries of modern times? AMSA's Rescue Coordination Centre Australia has received satellite imagery of objects possibly related to the search for the missing aircraft flight MH370. RCC Australia received an expert assessment of that satellite imagery this morning, 20th of March. The images were captured by satellite. They may not be related to the aircraft. The assessment of these images was provided by the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation as a possible indication of debris south of the search area that has been the focus of the southern search operation since Monday, 17th of March. One of the two large objects measures 24 metres. That's almost 79 feet. The other is five metres, some 15 feet. The sizes fit with what could be wreckage from an airline. And where they were spotted in the southern Indian Ocean seems to match the theory of a southern corridor, one of two possible diverted flight paths for the missing aircraft. It all makes this a credible discovery. Air Force planes from Australia and New Zealand have been dispatched from Perth to the suspected debris field. The search by air is being bolstered by a fleet on the sea. The Royal Navy's HMS Echo is en route to the search area. The coastal survey vessel has multi-beam sonar that could be utilised to listen out for the black box and a Norwegian ship has arrived in the area to help with the search. We have a vessel with uh, 19 very experienced and uh, skilled seafarers on board. They are all from uh, the Philippines, uh, employed by the company through our own uh, office there. Uh, the captain, he has been uh, employed in her outliners for 27 years. So, uh, and all of them, they are now participating in order to do a search and rescue operation in the best possible way. Family and loved ones have had their hopes raised and dashed too many times in the two harrowing weeks since the passenger jet disappeared. So now the language is tempered. This is a lead. It's not proof of the aircraft's fate. All the sensors that we have available are maximised uh, to detect any debris, life rafts or any uh, potential wreckage uh, if we do come across it from the uh, Malaysian Airlines flight that we are trying to locate. Very, very remote in the uh, southwestern part of the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, probably about 1,500 nautical miles to the southwest uh, of Perth. So uh, very remote um, and a very large, expansive area that we need to search. For anxiously waiting relatives, the news brings conflicting emotion. It's possibly an end to the two weeks of not knowing. But if this is the wreckage from the flight, it brings with it the certainty that they may never see their loved ones again.
We are still waiting for the results of forensic examination by the Australian government. If it turns out that it is MH370, then we will accept that. We cannot expect much because it has not been confirmed. We do not yet know for sure whether this is indeed MH370 or something else. But they will have to endure a further agonizing wait. Bad weather is hampering the search effort. Visibility is poor and finding the suspected debris is proving to be a challenge. This is the cockpit view from one of the first planes to scour the area. It gives you an idea of the task that lies ahead. AMSA uh, revised our search areas. Uh, so we searched a particular area that AMSA asked us to today. Uh, unfortunately, with the weather conditions, uh, as you experienced on the flight, uh, we were unable to locate any uh, wreckage or debris, um, but other aircraft are continuing to search up till uh, last light tonight. If this sighting does prove to be conclusive, then the search for answers can really begin. How and why did flight MH370 end up here, thousands of miles off its original flight path? Those crucial questions can only be answered if the plane's black box recorder can be found. But to locate the black box, the search teams must first find the debris. If the plane hits the water, it's obviously going to be damaged. You know, water, if you jump into it and you swim through it, is quite soft, it's quite benign. If you hit it at high speed, you know, in excess of 100 miles an hour, you're hitting a brick wall. And that causes the plane to break up. Now, fragments of that plane, if you've got things like empty fuel tanks, and having flown that distance, if this debris is the plane, um, they're going to be full of air, so they're going to float for a while. The wings will float for a short while if they come away from the aircraft. You're going to get air pockets trapped in parts of the fuselage, and those will help the fuselage float. But sooner or later, um, the air is going to be knocked out of those, um, and sooner or later, that debris is likely to sink, so it won't stay on the surface forever. And this is the race now to see if one can find that debris before it disappears from the surface. Standing by, ready to be launched, is an American team with the technology and expertise to search the seabed. It can deploy two underwater drones as deep as 6,000 meters. They work in tandem, scanning the floor in a lawnmower pattern. 10 meters one way, 10 meters back. It will go down a row, uh, it will turn and come back down again uh, on the other side. What, it, what it's doing is, is the, the side scan is running and it looks out and is getting returns back from primarily hard objects that are, that are on the bottom. All the rows in, in, the, in the mission are uh, put together and in, in created a mosaic and you can look at that and, and get an overall uh, view of, of the bottom and what, what is there. These underwater drones were used in a search for the wreckage of Air France 447 which crashed off the coast of Brazil in 2009. Even with a rough location to work in, finding it took some time, well over a year. This scan eventually led the team to it. But they need to know where to go, where to search. If the plane has crashed, its black box will only emit a signal for a few weeks more. Time is running out. It's possible that uh We'll never find out what happened. I think there just are so many unknowns right now. Uh, the issue of the plane just flying you know, without any or almost minimal tracking for a long period of time. You know, we need some more information. This warehouse in America is where the world's leading air crash investigators piece together clues from bits of mangled metal to determine how plane disasters happen. Their experience could prove invaluable for Malaysian investigators. If the aircraft breaks, the technical investigation will likely disclose the causes. But if the human breaks, the technical investigation may actually provide no answers as to what caused the accident or the incident or the crash. Next, in part two, the human tragedy. Some of the stories of the men, women and children on board the flight. Who were they, and will their waiting loved ones ever know what has become of them?
We now have a credible lead. There remains much work to be done. We do have uh, pretty strong satellite imagery and uh, uh, obviously uh, this is a very serious lead. Looking at an area approximately 1,500 miles to the west southwest of Perth. A satellite image showing two objects, both big enough to be wreckage from a crashed airliner. But are these parts of missing flight MH370? We do have uh, pretty strong satellite imagery, and uh, uh, obviously uh, this is a very serious lead in the way that nothing else so far really has been. Uh, it's very close to the predicted southern flight corridor and that I suppose uh, reinforces our suspicion that just maybe this is uh, the first tangible evidence that we've got of what might have happened. An Australian-led mission is now underway, combining assets from the New Zealand and US Air Forces, scrambling to a remote part of the southern Indian Ocean in an effort to end the mystery of the lost airline. All was 100% area complete of our initial uh, plus returning back to Radar 2. Information has been exchanged between the Australian, Malaysian and Chinese authorities, all desperately aware of what this could mean to anxious relatives. For the families around the world, the one piece of information that we want most, that they want most, is the information we just don't have, the location of MH370. Our primary focus has always been to find the aircraft, and with every passing day, our efforts have intensified. Yesterday, I said we wanted to reduce the area of the search. We now have a credible lead. There remains much work to be done to deploy these assets, and this work will continue overnight. The handling of the crisis has been severely criticised, fear and frustration turning to anger. Some relatives of the missing passengers were forcefully removed from a news conference in a Kuala Lumpur hotel. Let's go! The scenes were undignified. An inquiry was launched. As the days go by without sign of the plane or a clue as to its whereabouts, the uncertainty is becoming unbearable for the waiting families. They've been avoiding their responsibilities and talking nonsense. There are a lot of contradictory answers to our questions. That makes us very angry. I'm angry that the Malaysians don't tell the truth. They lie to the whole world. I'm totally frustrated about this. Where is my son? Even taxis have GPS. They can be found if they are lost or stolen. It's a huge plane, so high-tech and so advanced. How could it not be found? It's a joke. We have also learned more about the missing passengers, the personal stories of flight MH370. The youngest passenger is two years old, the oldest 76. Seven of them are children yet to reach their fifth birthdays. 26-year-old Yu Wen Chao is originally from Mongolia. He moved to study business at Hull University in England. He went back to see his girlfriend. Mukdesh Mukherjee and his wife, Xiaomo Bei, had been on a beach holiday together in Vietnam. Their two young sons are waiting for them at home. Could the flight manifest hold the answers? Investigators are scrutinizing every name on it. They say they still haven't received details for each passenger after all this time. The passenger manifest is obviously very important. It enables you to identify all the persons that are on board the aircraft, and that obviously is important for the security of the aircraft. 
but the Chinese authorities insist they have done their bit. China has investigated the backgrounds of all Chinese passengers on board the missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 and has found no evidence suggesting they are linked to destructive behavior on the aircraft. So we can rule out the suspicion that Chinese passengers are linked to a terror attack or destructive activities on the missing plane. Fifteen different nationalities were flying to Beijing that night. Among them, 153 from China, 38 from Malaysia, 5 from India, 4 French, 3 from the United States. Two Iranians on board became initial suspects, but seemed to have been ruled out. 35-year-old Ju Kung is a stuntman who was due to start work on a new series for Netflix in Malaysia next week. He was on his way to Beijing to see his two young children. Bob and Kathy Lawton are from Springfield Lakes in Australia. They have three daughters and they're described as doting grandparents. Whatever the fate of flight MH370, the pilots will have played some role. 53-year-old Zahari Ahmed Shah was the captain that evening. He's a vastly experienced pilot with more than 18 and a half thousand flying hours under his belt. He was a volunteer in the community program that I organized. Uh, at the end of the program, uh, there was this guy helping to stack chairs to clean up the place. And not having met him before, I asked who is this man? And I was told he works for Malaysian Airlines. I went to say thank you to him and he introduced himself, giving me his name card. And when I saw he was a, a captain of a 777, uh, you know, that's the kind of uh, humble person that Captain Zahari is. Captain Zahari's family have made and released a video asking for him to come home to them soon. He was hired by Malaysia Airlines directly out of school and uh, trained by Malaysia Airlines. Um, he was one of the original 777 fleet captains. Um, you know, he's a great guy. You know, just a great pilot. You know, I think it attests to his experience. It was 18,000 hours of flying, great career. The first officer was Farik Abdul Hamid. He's 27 years old and joined Malaysia Airlines in 2007. He was fairly new to this model of aircraft, a Boeing 777-200. Initial investigation uh, indicated it was the co-pilot uh, who, who basically spoke the last time uh, it was recorded on tape. CCTV shows the two men going through security on their way to boarding the flight that evening. We're told they did not specifically request to fly together. Police have started searching their homes, talking to friends and neighbors. They found this simulator in Captain Zahari's house. Investigators say that some data on it has been deleted. Local and international expertise have been recruited to examine the pilot's fight simulator. Some data has been deleted from the simulator and forensic work to retrieve this data is ongoing. His piloting skills would be great, you know, and, and I think he would do anything he could to preserve the lives of the, his passengers and, and the cargo, the property of Malaysia Airlines. Uh, he was really proud of that company. and. Um, It took almost two years for air crash investigators to find out what happened to Air France Flight 447. It vanished in a storm in June 2009, en route from Rio to Paris, with a loss of all 228 people on board. Brad Cleams, seen here on the left, was one of those who died. His brother feels the Malaysian authorities should be doing a lot more for the worried relatives of flight MH370. 
but they don't seem to be following some of the basic principles, again, which is to have one agency that's in control, that gives the information, that's transparent, and only gives information that they know can be verified and isn't going to be contradicted the next day. Uh, so, you know, the families uh, are, in that extent, do feel let down because they're not getting the clear information they deserve. Some of the Air France families have now written an open letter to those waiting for news of their loved ones on the Malaysian airliner. We obviously feel a lot of empathy for them. Um, we understand their situation pretty well. Um, I would say that um, it's still early days, but they need to, of course, count on the people they love, the people of their own family and their friends, and, and sort of um, get themselves together and organize themselves. And it's, it is a bit early, but there's probably a good argument that they need to uh, organize themselves into some form of an association to try to defend their rights and to push for the kind of information that they require. It's heartfelt advice from someone who knows exactly what they're going through. This mystery began with what should have been a routine flight. Now the search is focused thousands of miles to the south of its original flight path. Two unidentified pieces floating in the southern Indian Ocean. Wreckage from flight MH370, or yet another false lead in an aviation mystery that refuses to yield answers. And if this is wreckage from the flight, it will explain the where. But how long before the world learns for sure why a plane carrying 239 lives never reached its destination.